So I want to talk about Stephen King today, uh, specifically adaptations of his work. Now, for as long as Mr. King has been writing books, they have been making adaptations of them. And, you know, partly because his books are super popular, but also because where most of his books are horror, that genre can be made on the cheap. So there have been countless, probably hundreds, of adaptations of his works. Some of them very high quality, very famous, but there are a lot, and I mean a lot, of Stephen King adaptations that kinda go under people's radar. Ones they may not have heard about. So I kinda want to take a bit of a look into the wacky rabbit hole of King adaptations. We're just sorta gonna be going through his bibliography, bringing up stuff of note. If I've seen any of these movies, I'll let you know my thoughts on them. But it's not just movies, man. It's not just movies. Things are going to get very crazy very fast if you are not well versed on King's adaptations. A lot of these things I didn't even know existed until I researched them. That's really why I wanted to make a video. So and now, recording this on the 50th anniversary of Carrie, Let's talk Carrie. Carrie was the first, you know, big Stephen King adaptation. It really brought him into the mainstream, introduced him to a much bigger audience. And from the success of that original movie, which is great, it not only kickstarted this, you know, trend of quickly adapting everything Stephen King writes, but as well of a franchise in its own right. As they didn't just make one Carrie movie, they made four, two of which were remakes. And, you know, they really pale in comparison. You know, Carrie's one of those movies where I don't think it really needed a remake, so yeah, uh, it still holds up pretty well, and yeah, get, miss me with those. But I think what's more interesting about all the Carrie movies they made <laughs> is the Broadway musical. If you have never heard of the Carrie musical, I, I envy you. So this came out in the late 80s, and it is notorious for being one of the biggest bombs in Broadway history. It has since gained a cult following to the point where it was actually featured on an episode of Riverdale, which is probably the worst fate that any musical can have. Uh, so, so, so yeah, neat, 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 little, neat little history there. <laughs> I am the sound of distant thunder So yeah, nothing of value really has come out of this franchise since the 70s. Salem's Lot was up next. Uh, we got a pretty iconic TV miniseries, which I think has aged a bit, uh, but I do enjoy it. Uh, continuing this weird trend of making sequels to books without sequels, we also got the return to Salem's Lot. Then they made another miniseries in the 2000s, and Warner Brothers is currently sitting on a brand new movie uh, that has been, like, done for years. Apparently, they're, they, they still seem committed to releasing it, but we don't really know what their plan is. Uh, eh. It's directed by Gary Doberman, uh, who I think is hit or miss, but he has put out some good stuff, and I am really optimistic about this movie, because Salem's Lot is one of my favorite books, and like I said, the miniseries has aged a bit. I would like to see an updated take. We'll see how it goes. I don't know, man. The Shining gave us one of the most famous King adaptations, Stanley Kubrick's movie. It's famous for, you know, its quality, its themes, its messaging. It's very very cryptic, very creepy stuff. But also, uh, because of how different it was from the book and how King kind of hated it. And while I do love both the movie and the book, yeah, I can definitely see why, because the movie, while it does follow the plot of the book pretty well, when it comes to, like, its characters and its themes, yeah, it's very drastically different. So King decided to make his own Shining, and, uh, you know, sometimes being a great novelist does not translate to being a great screenwriter, and if you just look at King's screenwriting filmography, yeah, nowhere is that more clear. <laughs> now, The Stand really stumped studios when it came out, because there is no way, no matter how many strings they pulled, they couldn't really fit it into a single movie. And thank goodness they didn't try. In fact, no one tried until the 1990s uh, when we got a TV miniseries. A trend we'll start to see is that a lot of King's books are so big that they just opt to turn them into miniseries series instead of movies. I've seen a bit of this series, and I think it's okay. I don't know. It's whatever. That doesn't really capture the stand for me. And they actually tried again very recently with a new miniseries, and honestly, same thing. <laughs> not not a huge fan of it. I, I don't know. I don't think the stand is impossible to adapt, but it, it does seem to be causing some problems. Also, of course, as soon as I saw Stephen King was writing for this show, I was like, oh man, oh... Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> so all these things I've talked about, pretty common knowledge, nothing too crazy. A few weird sequels and remakes and stuff. But this is where things 
are, are about to get wacky. So The Dead Zone, it has a uh, fairly famous movie starring Christopher Walken, and I do think it is a great movie. But would you believe if I told you they not only made a Dead Zone TV series, but it ran for 80 episodes across six seasons. <laughs> I've never heard of this in my... What is this? What? Now, it's actually kind of a smart idea, because if you've read The Dead Zone, it almost sort of feels like a bunch of serialized stories with, you know, one uh, overarching plot. Definitely feels like it could have been a season of a TV show. So it seems like they sort of just took the concept and ran with it. I don't know anything about this show at all. I don't know if it's good, if people liked it. I mean, it ran for six seasons. I mean, like, no one ever talks about this thing. I don't... <laughs> one touch, and I can see things. Things that happened. Things that will happen. You should see what I see. And now that brings us into Night Shift. Night Shift was a gold mine for studios. King's short fiction in general is pretty much perfect for making a quick buck, because you can sort of just pick out anything and, and go wild with it. And go wild, they absolutely did. Night Shift has given us the longest franchise we are going to be talking about. I know what you're thinking. The Mangler, the story about the, uh, the industrial washing machine that comes to life and eats people. No, silly, that only got three movies. Now, this one's a bit more well-known, so it's probably not a surprise. But Children of the Corn, which is like 30 pages long, has 11 films. Absolutely baffling. It is it is insane how these movies continue to be profitable. But, you know, if you look into it, there is an entire industry of low-budget horror movies, and they're always awful, and they're always making money. And Children of the Corn is one of the, uh, the weirdest success stories out there. Of all the Stephen King movies that could be spun off into endless sequels, it's so odd that it was this one. Because the original movie wasn't even good. Like, it's very clear that they were just taking a short story concept and stretching it out as far as they could. I don't even know what's going on in Children of the Corn 8. <laughs> and a lot of his other short stories here, whether they be in Night Shift or other collections, have gotten a variety of adaptations over the years. Whether they be their own thing, but uh, most often they were actually uh, turned into anthologies for other projects. The Creepshow movie is, of course, famous for doing some of Stephen King's stories, as well as the recent TV show. Even stuff like Twilight Zone and Tales from the Dark Side picked a bit out of his bibliography. Okay, going back to the classics here, Fire starter, got a movie, got a, got a weird sequel, got a remake. That's kind of like the average Stephen King adaptation experience, uh, and I don't really like any of these. Though the new one in particular, horrible. Abs absolutely horrible. Like, the original at least, like, sort of stuck to the plot of the book. The minute this one veered off track, I knew we were in for some garbage. And yeah, we definitely were. Love Zac Efron, Wildcats forever. But he definitely got to be making more like Iron Claw type stuff. Now just stay away from this. Cujo got a movie. I have no, no, nothing to say on that. So did The Running Man with Arnold, of course. The Dark Tower. I don't want to talk about Dark Tower right now. We can, we can talk about Dark Tower later. Now, Different Seasons was another gold mine, but for a good reason this time. As three of its four novellas have been turned into movies, two of which really need no introduction. I mean, Stand By Me is a coming-of-age classic, and it would be hard to find someone who doesn't think that The Shawshank Redemption is one of the greatest movies ever made. And yeah, I'll join the herd of sheep here because, you know, it, it is really that good. It's funny because a lot of people don't actually know that he wrote The Shawshank Redemption, because a lot of people really only associate him with horror, so when you get, you know, this, like, heavy drama film, they don't really make the connection. But yeah, I do find it kind of ironic how, you know, what many people consider to be the best of movie based on his work uh, it has nothing really to do with what he is known for as a writer. So yeah, definitely watch this if you haven't, and uh, keep an eye out for Shawshank 2 coming out next year. Brooks is back, baby. Also, Apt Pupil uh, is, is a good novella, not a great movie. I, uh, like, like, there are some cool things about it, but Brian Singer being the director kind of just ruined Yeah, mm. John Carpenter took a stab at uh, Christine, the, the book about, you know, the, the weird evil car thing. I, I don't know, I haven't read Christine. <laughs> and Pet Cemetery also gave us a pretty famous movie from the 80s, which of course then got an original sequel, uh, then a remake in 2019, followed by a prequel uh, to that one, which just came out. I don't particularly like any of these. I haven't seen the new prequel. I, I hear it's just dreadful, though. Pet Cemetery is one of the best Stephen King books, and I just don't think any of these movies have really captured it. A lot of people have scary memories of the original movie, because they probably watched it when they were younger, but it's so goofy, it's so goofy, man. Like, all the parts that are supposed to be, like, terrifying or sad, I'm just, like, giggling through the whole thing. 
yeah. I think that one is worth watching for the novelty, but don't let it be your first experience with this story, please. Cycle of the Werewolf gave a silver bullet. Eh, just, eh, eh. Thinner got a movie. I think I saw a Nostalgia Critic do that when I was like 12 or something. It, of course, it. Very, very, very famous book. Very famous adaptations. You know, this would be more like a franchise I'm expecting 11 sequels out of, not Children of the Corn. Anyway, yeah, it originally got a TV miniseries, uh, which I think is goofy. It's okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It has does have some iconic moments, of course. Tim Curry as Pennywise. Amazing. And then, uh, and then spookily 27 years later... Like I, I, like, I know that probably wasn't planned, but the fact that it worked out to that... Mm, mm. We got It Chapter 1 followed by It Chapter 2. We got It Chapter 1 followed by It Chapter 2. A very, very popular movie. Some of the highest grossing horror movies of all time. And I think I'm with most people here when I think the, the first one is really good. Really great, fun summer horror movie. All the kids are fantastic. Fun, campy scares really captures the spirit of the original book, even though if it doesn't follow the plot super well. Uh, but it chapter two kinda, kinda stumbles on its face. <laughs> Not a great film. It, it does have some good moments, but I think it leaned too much into the comedy, and it definitely had a lot of trouble adapting, like, some of the crazier stuff that happens in It that they needed to do for this unit, for the adult side of the story. So it is kind of disappointing we still don't have the definitive uh, adaptation of It, and I don't really like the idea of this prequel that they're doing, like, wh why make a prequel? We already know what happens to Pennywise, like... I don't know. We'll we'll see we'll see how that goes, I suppose. Now Misery, another one that got a very famous adaptation, and in my opinion, it is one of the best King adaptations out there. It's a really, really excellent movie. And I'm very uh, grateful that no one has really ever tried to readapt Misery. I think some of the characters showed up in that Castle Rock show, uh, which I we can talk about later. Some of this stuff goes crazy. I, I don't even want to get into it yet. <laughs> But yeah, Misery is just Misery, and Misery is delightful. Tommy Knockers got a miniseries. I... <laughs> James Wan is trying to, to make a new one happen. Listen, I love James... No one likes James Wan more than me. But I think we should probably just leave the Tommy Knockers behind. Like, I... <laughs> Dark Half got a movie, uh, or something, I don't know. Needful Things, the only thing really, uh, memorable about this one is that it inspired both the title and the font choice for Stranger Things. So, so good, good for that, I suppose. I've never seen the movie, I will be reading the book later in the year, I'll probably check the movie out after that. I've not heard great things about the movie, but I, I am excited for the book. Gerald's Game, hello Mike. Mike is one of my favorite horror directors. Nearly everything he puts out, I think, is just fantastic. His stuff was very inspired by King, so it makes sense for him to be handed the reins for adaptations. And the first one he did was Gerald's Game, which I think is easily one of the best King adaptations. It's one of my favorite movies from him. It's so intense, there's so much character to it. And while I haven't read Gerald's Game, I have heard from a lot of people that it is a big improvement over the book. And it's a book that isn't really talked about all that much, so there's a good chance you haven't seen Gerald's Game. Go do it. It's on Netflix. It is wonderful. And with that, with the coming of Mike, I think we're gonna call it here. Obviously, there's a lot I still haven't talked about yet. Like, like we haven't talked about Haven yet, guys. Haven or Under the Dome or The Miss TV show. There is no end to this rabbit hole, let me tell you. So in a bit, I will return to talk about some more adaptations of King's more modern stories, as well as some of the stuff I missed. So, sorry. And some potential future projects that may be coming out. But I want to get you guys involved too, so in the comments down below, I want to hear from you whether some of your guys' favorite and least favorite Stephen King adaptations. Whether you just think they're good or bad as movies, good or bad as adaptations. What's the deal? Have you seen all 80 episodes of The Dead Zone? I would love to hear from you because what the heck? Did you know there was a Nightmares and Dreamscapes TV show? Did you know there was a Bag of Bones movie with, with Pierce Brosnan? <laughs> It's insane. There's so much here, so much to talk about. Thanks for watching. Uh, stay tuned for the follow-up. Uh, but for now, we have the Angel of Indian Lake to finally talk about. Coma for six years. And then I woke up and found my fiance married to another man. My son doesn't know who I am. Everything has changed, including me. One touch, and I can see things. Things that happened. Things that will happen. You should see what I see.